Hi, folks, and welcome to another episode of Health Talk from Mars. It's out of this world. In today's episode, I want to talk about a topic near and dear to my heart, and that is protein, and why everything that you've learned about protein is probably incorrect. So stay tuned. So recently, I got a received a question from a viewer asking about how to get enough protein in their diet if they're eating a strictly plant-based or vegan diet. So that got me thinking about all the protein myths that are out there. So the first question is, what is protein and why is it so important in the body? Well, you can't live without protein. Protein is an essential ingredient to manufacture enzymes, connective tissue, including your bones and your muscles, and even making hormones, protein is required. So it's required for various structures in the body and also biochemical enzymes. So how did we determine how much protein is required? So we determined that by simple studies that measure nitrogen excretion. So about one sixth of protein is made up of nitrogen. So the amount of nitrogen that you give off in the form of sweat, urine, and feces determines how much nitrogen that you need to replace on a daily basis. So if we look at that number, so they actually took volunteers, it's really interesting, kind of gross, and they had them wear these suits 24-7, and they collected feces, they collected urine, and they collected sweat. And they painstakingly measured exactly how much nitrogen they excreted on a daily basis. And what they came up with was approximately for a 150-pound person, about 22 grams, which comes out to about 0.3 to 0.4 grams per kilogram body weight. So if we go two standard deviations above that, we come up with 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram body weight. So that is the RDA requirement for protein. Well, how much protein does the average American consume? Well, the average American consumes anywhere from 70 to 90 grams of protein a day. So that's on an omnivore diet. Vegans get a little bit less, so 70 to 75 grams of protein, which is still way above the RDA for protein. And again, the RDA set for protein is two standard deviations above the average. So that means the vast majority of people need a lot less protein than that. So what is the problem with consuming too much protein? So that is a very important question because most people are supplementing their diets with various protein powders and protein shakes, thinking they actually need to get extra amounts of protein, which is totally false. It's not necessary. A bodybuilder, someone who is working out with weights hours a day and trying to put muscle mass on, it's estimated that the amount of extra protein that they require is only at the very most about 10% more than the 8.8 grams per kilogram body weight. So that means that even the average American, if they were a bodybuilder, they're getting too much protein in their diet. So back to the question, why is it a problem if your protein intake is too high? Well, for one, When you're consuming uh, a higher amount of protein, it makes your acid balance more acidic in your tissues. A more acidic environment increases inflammation in the body. So we want to decrease amount of inflammation in the body. And that is something that we can do by alkalinizing the blood. Alkalinizing the blood happens when we eat more fruits and vegetables. Okay, what else is a problem with too much protein? Well, we know that the protein needs to get deaminated. That means the nitrogen part of the molecule needs to get cleaved off. 
And in this process, the kidneys are heavily involved. So when you eat an excessive amount of protein, what happens is the kidneys need to work extra hard. So when we look at populations that consume excessive amounts of protein, we see that there are a number of biochemical factors that come up on their blood work. One is they have an increase in insulin-like growth factor one. So insulin-like growth factor one is a hormone that stimulates the growth of proteins in the body. So if you are making cancerous cells and you have high levels of insulin-like growth factor one, you're going to tend to promote the growth of these cancer cells. And we know as protein intakes get higher, there's an increased risk of developing various types of cancer. In addition, we find that elevated levels of protein increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. So way back when Ansel Keys first did studies on Americans and Europeans, he found that when their protein intake was higher, they had higher cardiovascular disease. So keeping your protein down to the minimum amount is going to be more important than trying to overdo protein. Increased protein has also been associated with osteoporosis as it can increase the amount of calcium excretion from the kidneys. So you can see there's a number of reasons why we don't really want excess protein in the diet. From an environmental standpoint, it takes more energy to produce protein. So that requires more resources from the environment. That would be water as well as other constituents as well in terms of farming. So again, keeping your protein intake lower is going to be more advantageous for you in the long run. It's estimated as we get older that our protein requirements may become a little bit higher, maybe 10%. But again, as I've pointed out, we already get too much protein in our diet. It's not necessary to consume all this extra protein. So you want to make sure that you're eating a diet that has a varied types of protein. So that would be if you're eating a vegan diet, back to the question at hand, you know, how does a vegan get enough protein to sustain all of their bodily activities. And the key is diversification. You wanna make sure that you're basically getting a wide array of different proteins. So a wide array of different proteins is going to assure you that you consume all nine of the essential amino acids. So one of the criteria for making sure that you're getting enough protein is to making sure that the quality of protein that you consume is going to be of the highest quality. So sometimes plant sources of protein get viewed as lesser quality because they may be missing certain amino acids, essential amino acids. Again, back to the question in hand, how diversified is your diet? So if you're consuming a diet that has a significant number of different grains, vegetables, and fruits, you're going to cover all of those amino acids. So I oftentimes like to show people a picture of a plate of broccoli, and I ask them, how much protein does this pr plate of broccoli, more protein, more uh, broccoli than anyone would normally eat in a serving, but it's just, you know, representation of like foods have more protein than you think. So the answer to the question is 27 grams of protein. Now that protein is missing several uh, amino acids that are essential. So if you eat that, that broccoli with some rice, you're going to cover your bases. In the past, it was thought that it was necessary to eat all of these proteinaceous foods together at the same time. So you consume these essential amino acids in the same meal. That's actually been found not to be true. And as long as you get on a daily basis a wide array of amino acids from different plant sources, you're going to get all of your protein requirements met. So the question also came up about soy protein and about soy in general. So soy is a very controversial topic and also near and dear to my heart. 
I am a big fan of soy and soy derivatives, and especially soy in its whole natural state. Unfortunately, 97% of all soy that's grown is genetically modified, and mostly it's grown to feed farm animals. So that type of soy I'm definitely not in favor of, and also very processed soy isolate compounds I'm not a fan of. But things like tofu that are relatively minimally processed is an excellent source of protein, an excellent source also of essential fatty acids, in particular, omega-3 fatty acids. So especially I'm an advocate of soy products that have been fermented. So if we look at natto, natto is a fermented soy that has a significant amount of vitamin K, MK7 in there, which is really important for your bones. Um, other types of soy derivatives would be tempeh. So tempeh is another fermented form of soy, which is also excellent for you. And then we also have things like adamami, which is basically just soy beans that you can eat out of the pods. And that is also, again, an excellent source of protein. You know, a half a cup of tofu, which is basically soy, contains about 12 grams of protein in there. So that's a tremendous amount. Last night, I probably ate a good cup of uh, tofu, organic tofu. And so basically, I got 24 grams just in the tofu alone. So tofu normally is relatively tasteless. And, you know, it's something that you use to add to other foods. Uh, other foods to consider, beans, especially legumes, are extremely high in protein. One cup, or I should say one can of beans, black beans, has about 19 grams of protein in there. Mostly pretty high quality protein. So when we're looking at, at plant sources again, we can get a tremendous amount of protein just from plants. There's a product I came across a few months ago, and it's a product that's made specifically out of mushrooms. You can get frozen. It's called Meaty, M-E-A-T-I. And it's these soy, it's these, excuse me, mushroom patties. One small mushroom patty has in it 17 grams of protein, which is a tremendous amount. So again, even... You know, things like fruits, apples, and bananas have small amounts of protein, but they all add up. So when you consume a whole variety of them, you're going to get a significant amount more protein added to your meal. So I frequently recommend that people add as much as they can legumes into their diet. So if they're eating a salad, they could add kidney beans or black beans to the salad. Now we'll uh, substantially boost up their level of protein intake in their diet. They could add also those mushrooms, which I mentioned also have a significant amount of protein in there. So again, the key is to eat a whole foods, plant-based diet where you're getting a wide variety of different food sources of protein. When you do that, you're almost assuredly going to get all the essential nine amino acids that you require for all your protein needs. And then as long as you're getting enough calories. And certainly you want to make sure that your digestion is optimal as possible. So what we know is when we get older, we produce less hydrochloric acid in the stomach. That means that your ability to break down proteins will be a little bit compromised. So there are a number of things that you can do to stimulate the production of hydrochloric acid in the stomach. One is you can actually take hydrochloric acid capsules or tablets to supplement the acid that you already have in your stomach. The other thing is to use some herbal bitters. Herbal bitters are a way to stimulate the stomach's own production of hydrochloric acid. Of course, slowing down your eating, making sure that you don't just slough down your food is also going to make the stomach acid that you have more efficient. So making sure that you're conscious about when you're eating. So I wanted to make a little shout out about blue zones. So blue zones are areas in the world where people live the longest. 
and they live the healthiest, so they have the longest health span. They tend not to get dementia. They don't get the same diseases that we do in Western civilization. So in their diet, all five of the blue zones that have been discovered in the world, they consume a diet that's very significantly higher in legumes. In fact, they eat beans or legumes about two to three times per day. And so this is something that we, fu- we believe fully has contributed to their health and their longevity. So there's a number of really good resources, books that you can read. The Okinawa program based on the Blue Zone in Okinawa would be one to really read. The Blue Zones, another one by Dan Buettner, uh, is also a very important book. Joel Furman, Eat to Live, is also an excellent book that you can read. Uh, Rip Esselstyn's book, uh, The Fire Engine Diet, is also an excellent reference book. And How Not to Die and How Not to Age by Michael Greger. All these books would be excellent resources on how you can improve on your plant-based diet. And they have a number of recipes uh, for various meals that you can cook up. And it has the amounts of various nutrients such as protein and fiber in there. So very helpful in constructing your diet. I hope that answers your question. If you have any more questions, feel free to comment down below and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for joining me on another Health Talk from Mars. It's out of this world. I'll see you next time.